Hello and welcome to Diabetes Connections in the News. I'm Stacey Sims and these are the top diabetes stories and headlines of the past seven days. As usual, all sources linked up at diabetes-connections.com when this airs as a podcast. In the News is brought to you by the world's worst diabetes mom, real life stories of parenting a child with type 1 diabetes. Winner of the best new nonfiction at the American Book Fest and named a Book Authority Best Parenting Book. Available in paperback, ebook, or audiobook at Amazon.com. Our top story a look at how insulin holds up under real world and often hotter conditions than is recommended. Doctors Without Borders found that a range of insulins can be stored at warmer temperatures than previously recommended. They showed it's okay above 77 degrees, all the way up to 99 degrees for four weeks. This is really important, not just for emergency settings like refugee camps, but for people who live in areas without refrigeration. They often have to travel to health clinics, which may be far away and which can't send them home with the insulin. The group now says pharmaceutical companies should urgently submit to regulatory authorities for use of insulin under expanded temperature ranges. This story came out a few weeks back, but I haven't seen it anywhere. Big headlines this week about metformin and the risk of birth defects in the babies of men who take it. Metformin is a very common diabetes drug taken by tens of millions of people around the world. Sons born to men taking it were more than three times as likely to have a genital birth defect as unexposed babies. These problems were relatively rare, occurring in fewer than 1% of all babies with dads who took metformin, but it is significant because of the number of people who take it. These researchers say the paper's findings are preliminary and observational only, and that men with diabetes should not abruptly stop metformin before trying to conceive. Reassuringly, the researchers saw no effect for men who took the drug earlier in life or even a year before the baby was born. Expect a lot more research to come out on this one. Grain of salt needed here, but new research may show that people with type 1 are likely to manage better if they have high levels of psychological resilience. This was a British study that followed 1,800 people with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. They used a questionnaire to determine how they adapted to change and focused under pressure. The researchers found people with type 1 diabetes who had low psychological resilience also had poorer blood sugar control after two years. The idea is that something like this would offer the opportunity to identify those who might benefit most from additional support when they are first diagnosed. Among patients with diabetes, women are just as likely as men to suffer from sexual dysfunction, but their issues are overlooked. Big session on this at the Diabetes UK Professional Conference this week. Researchers say women with diabetes can experience reduced sexual desire, painful sex, and other issues which can increase the risk of depression, but these issues are usually untreated despite help being available. They talk about the embarrassment factor here and the idea that many women with sexual dysfunction don't realize diabetes could be a factor. And they encourage healthcare professionals to go beyond conversations about contraception, pregnancy, and menstruation. A recent study led by Belgian researchers found an equal number of men to women with diabetes reported sexual dysfunction. Concerning new trend about prediabetes, it has doubled among children over the last 20 years. The increase was seen over almost all subpopulations of young Americans, regardless of income, ethnicity, and education. This study in the journal Pediatrics included kids 12 to 19 years old from 1999 to 2018, and the rate went from 11.6% to 28.2%. Prediabetes means blood glucose levels are higher than normal, but not yet at the diabetes threshold. The researchers here are quick to point out they don't know the reason why this is happening. While diet and exercise are usually what's pointed to, it is not clear that's the reason behind this rise. Huge new study of more than 3 million people say those with type 2 have a higher risk of 57 other health conditions. Experts describe the findings as stark and alarming and said it underlined the urgent need to reduce the risk of more people developing type 2. This study is not yet peer-reviewed. It focused on people over 30. These researchers say the higher risk occurs when people are diagnosed with type 2 before the age of 50. So that's why they focused on this younger cohort. I want to let you know about the Diabetes Plus Mental Health Virtual Conference coming up in May. This is a two-day event that will highlight ways in which living with diabetes affects mental health. There are two tracks, one for patients, one for caregivers and providers. I am excited to let you know I'm taking part in here just in a very lighthearted way. I am hosting a game show type session where you'll be able to meet some of the presenters and participants. 
lots more information. I will link it up. Registration is open now, and early bird pricing ends April 3rd. On this week's long format episode, we're talking to JDRF about the new nonprofit insulin that they have backed, they've given financial backing to. Why will this effort from Civica RX be different? We will talk about it. And next week, we're going to have a conversation with one of the women in the Jocelyn Medalist study. She was diagnosed nearly 70 years ago. Shares her story and why she's excited about being part of this incredible group. And boy, the Jocelyn Medalists really are just a terrific group. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. And that is in the news for this week. If you like it, please share it. Thanks so much for joining me. I'll see you back here soon. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.